Thank you. Ready to go? I'm okay. ready. I'm not okay. sure what we're going to talk about, but All right. I'm sure well, you'll lead me. I'll lead you. All right. Okay. All right. So five, four, <laughs> three, two, and one. All right, folks, welcome back to the Trauma Difference Podcast. Guy McPherson here, and I am thrilled to have back Dr. Sharon Stanley. Sharon, welcome. Thank you so much, Guy. I appreciate being back and checking in again. Awesome. All right. So Dr. Stanley has educated thousands of healthcare professionals internationally in the principles and practices of somatic psychotherapy. Building on her research on empathy with traumatized youth, Sharon founded Somatic Transformation, a body-based relational methodology based in interpersonal neural psychology, ancient wisdom, and the somatic emotional lived experience. Sharon participates in Dr. Ellen Shore's Seattle study group and her work with First Nations, the study of Afro-Brazilian healing with ongoing research into clinical practice has led to a fluid convergence of neurological research and professional skills. Welcome back. Thank you, Guy. So we were talking just briefly just before we recorded about how each of us is doing and mm -hmm. we're talking about the fires and... Um, how has the whole the pandemic impacted you and what you've been doing with work, et cetera? You know, it's so complex, isn't it, Guy, to be able to describe the different layers and levels of the way this pandemic has affected me, my family, my community, my work. Um, I think generally, uh, I could say that it has really increased my, my awareness, my consciousness of many different levels that I hadn't really perceived before. And I think it has brought me into a real depth of feeling on many different levels. Just the feeling of gratitude for my grandchildren and for uh, the work that I do. Uh, I think one of the things that maybe is a, an outcome of this pandemic is I've learned how to swim in cold water. <laughs> and, and I mean that literally. I've been going out to uh, a dock on Puget Sound, and you know it's about 55 degrees in the sound, and swimming about three times a week. Wow. And there's something about uh, facing my fear of cold water and swimming and getting in there and moving uh, that I think has become symbolic. And I, I hope I continue it as, as the fall increases, but it's, um, it, it feels like it's kind of a metaphor for what we're into in terms of the complexity of intense change and intense affect that we're seeing um, on a global, climate level on a local level where we've both talked about the smoke and how it's affecting us on our family level uh, the pandemic or work there's so many levels politics where we could either come apart or we can come back together in a new way and i'm not sure that makes sense but that's kind of my overall sense of jumping into cold water yeah so it's an opportunity certainly and and how we utilize that how we perceive that is is definitely up to us um but first so the cold water thing <laughs> did that just come about because you wanted to get out and exercise and that was the way to social socially distance or what you know i don't know that i really thought about it but there was one hot day this summer that the cold water felt like well that might be an option and so I jumped in and there was an exhilaration of uh, just being able to be in that cold water and to swim, the freedom of swimming in, in, in the water that um, is salt water, it's cold, it's real primal. It felt mm -hmm. like, felt like uh, just kind of getting right down into it. And I, I, I kind of get the feeling over and over that we are in the midst of trauma. You know, so much of what I've spent years working with is post-traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. But we're not in post-traumatic stress at the moment so much as we're in the moments of 
that can be traumatizing. And how do we meet them? How do we uh, process the affect that comes up in the moment so that we can move from this intense feeling that emerges that's there into meaning? And, and that's kind of where I'm really interested right now. Uh, so much of post-traumatic work is about um, basically clearing the residue of affect from the past that hasn't been resolved. But what I'm beginning to recognize is that when we're in the midst of trauma, we can take a real lesson from Viktor Frankl and the experience he had in a concentration camp where as soon as he found a meaning for his experience, he was able to have a tremendous amount of courage and wisdom and support from all the people around him. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the struggle I'm facing and others around me are facing is how do we make meaning out of this lived experience we're in in this moment? Yeah, that um, I, I love that. I mean, I think that's such a uh, great point about we are in the midst of trauma. This is yeah. that's exactly what Jeannie Fisher was saying. She was saying mm -hmm. you can heal trauma when it's past, but when you're in the midst of it, you're in the midst of it. Right. But my question to you is, I mean, I guess this this can go for 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 anything. How do you make meaning? Is it just uh, we each have to come up with our own personal meaning, our own story for what this, for what this is. I mean, just before you respond to that, just quickly, when I, when this all started, mm -hmm. you know, this, uh, the pandemic started and um, the news was just on and on and on about COVID and the, and the uh, rates going up and people thought I was go, I was so stressed i was so anxiety ridden mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i was like all right how i can't do this because the kids were home my wife was working yeah. the kids how am i gonna deal with this and i right. realized that i just had to stop looking at the news otherwise it was going to go nuts but having said that how do i don't that to me that's that's hard to make meaning out of this but it sounds like you have guy I got a sense as you were speaking that there is a tremendous amount of emotion that came at that moment. Oh, yeah. And uh, that that emotion, uh, you, I could just feel as you were speaking, you were containing it. Mm -hmm. And as you contain that emotion, uh, somehow in that containment, mm -hmm. that emotion moved in or that feeling of that emotion moved into, and this is my guess, that you decided what was really important to you. Uh, what, what was important for you to do at this time. Right. And you mentioned the kids and, and the challenges you had. I can only imagine all of the, the complexity of feelings, but I get a sense in this moment that you know what's important to you. Well, you're you're exactly right. I I did decide um, what was important because I, I said to myself, "This is I cannot right. let this right. just completely debilitate me." I've got a five year old over there and an eleven year old over there that right. I need to show up for and be present. Yeah. Yeah. And you're right. That's what I that's what I said to myself. Yeah, what's important? And there's a five year old and a seven year old, mm -hmm. and they need me. Right. And, um, and you hit, got, your purpose was really clear there, embodied in those children. And, um, and as you knew that, as you clarified that, that was the meeting, wasn't mm. it? So similarly, each of us has to find that, our own meaning in, that, in this? You know, I think this is where relational therapy is critical. I don't know that, uh, I, I, I really admire that you could do that on your own. And yet it was about relationship. And, and one of the things I, I've been so aware of lately is how important it is that I seek 
in the relationships close to me, people that I love and trust, I seek what their vision is of me and where I'm not seeing everything mm -hmm. about me and um, how these relational connections I have with people I love and trust help me go way beyond where I've been before. Mm. Uh, like a call, that we're not meant to do this on our own and, and we're not meant to just do it with dyads. I think this is a collective trauma and I think we need to do it on a, on a larger scale. Lovely, luckily I live in a, in a community that has been developed because they wanted to be in community. It's a, wow. a group of homes that share, share a particular space and other amenities. And a number of us got together online and been talking about, about racial issues, about privilege, about our feelings. And we went far beyond um, what I could have even imagined. People that I hadn't really gotten to know, but talking about what was really true for us and what our experience was. And the closer we get to this truth of our experience and can talk about it in a collective, in a community or in relationships, I think the faster we get to that meaning. Mm -hmm. and, and then we share it. Then we're not alone. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think there's anything like, I mean, it's really different than the trauma bond where a trauma bond creates a kind of a tie or inner connection that's destructive where the kind of coming together with a shared purpose and meaning um, brings me back to stories. Uh, for some reason, I, I'm, I'm, I'm always entranced by the stories of people, how people made it through World War II. And um, the stories that I, I heard of people in the, in the indigenous communities that I worked with, of how they, they couldn't imagine doing it on their own. It had to be done collectively. And that's what Stephen Porges' research is all about, is when we come together as a collective with shared meaning, we're going to be able to negotiate mm -hmm. in a much different way than we, if we have to be alone and try and survive on our own. Because then we have to use sympathetic arousal. Mm -hmm. And if we have to use sympathetic arousal, we've got the adrenaline and cortisols destroying our body and our, our isolation. But when we can come together in this collective, in this shared meaning, shared space of social engagement, we can negotiate in a way that takes us to a higher level, I think, maybe of humanity. I see that as a potential right now. <clears throat> So the importance of reaching out, yeah. finding community, getting yes. involved in a time where physically that's yeah. really challenging, of course. Exactly. Um, but I love how you're, you're highlighting the, the importance of that. How, what are some ways people might do that? Well, here we are, you and I. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the Zoom is one way. Um, the neighborhood community I live in, we've got a number of uh, wooden chairs outside that we can sit six feet apart and wear our masks and, and communicate. Um, it, it feels like we have to keep trying to make contact. I, I probably do four or five Zooms a day with individuals, with communities, with small groups. And, I'm amazed at how the potential of people to come together, even just using this internet platform that, you know, it brings us face to face mm -hmm. and it, it really, uh, we can hear each other's voices. And when we have intense emotions, we can actually see how this medium can't often deal with all that energy in us and it mm -hmm. kind of freezes up. Mm -hmm. um, so, it's here now. We've got it. Right. Yeah, I love that. I mean, to me, what you said about, you know, uh, kind of honoring the relationships you have and, and utilize them in a sense as, as, right. as a mirror, you talked about 
kind of uh, what highlighting your your or being aware of your your blind spots, as it were. Yeah. Now, literally, how do you do that? Do you ask someone? What are you seeing? How do you do that? I think it's kind of about building relationships where feelings really are the core, where you're safe to be able to talk about deeper and deeper feelings inside and and being able to listen as the other describes theirs and gradually just kind of where we have this social agreed upon norm mm -hmm. we're starting to drop down deeper and deeper as the trust develops as I, the term dialogue has been coming where the dia the two and the log the uh, way of knowing and where dialogue is so different than discussion. We're in a dialogue where we're talking about what matters, what's true. Mm -hmm. And we discover that as we talk about it with a listener that cares. Mm -hmm. And how do we, and I think one of the benefits I've found with this time is I'm not traveling as much. I'm not going into environments that are unfamiliar. I was traveling a lot and giving a lot of uh, classes or lectures, but I'm home. I'm in my, I'm in my, with my garden. I'm with my, and, and each day I, I can be with the weather, the trees, the sun, the smoke, even will you, if you will. Um, and so the more I'm present to my lived experience of the day and the rhythm of it, the more I can be present with other people. And if I really care about that, then that's what I'm going to do. And the few people I have in my so-called pod that I see, how do I get to know them deeper and deeper and hold that space for them to reveal themselves to me? Mm. And then I'm more able to reveal myself. Something so so grounding feeling in what you're saying. And it, it feels like, to me, as you're talking, I'm feeling very grounded and and as opposed to or in um juxtaposition to the anxiety i was talking about before when all this you know the the, the news of the pandemic was was constantly rolling around in my brain there's something so um i don't know elemental and 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 it feels it feels very it feels very secure in what you're saying like uh, I, I don't feel scared. You know, you're, you're, you're talking to me about creating a, um, and maybe this is just the power of relationship, creating a space and a foundation of trust. I don't know. I was just, I was just saying that what you're describing to me just feels there's a, there's a solidity to it, a grounding to it that makes me feel like, oh, we can get through this. But oh, yeah. it, it feels like there has to, it has to do with the relation, like sh a shared humanity in a sense. Yes. Yes. And I, I, mean, I, I guess I'm, I wish all of us <laughs> had that community you had. That sounds well, amazing. <laughs> I think it's all about starting from where you are. Mm. I mean, five-year-olds are so amazing in knowing truth. Right. And seven-year-olds, too. You know, uh, just starting exactly with where you are. And then step-by-step <clears throat> step, uh, expanding that. <clears throat> Not going too fast. Right, right. How does that translate to... Um, say the people who are listening to this, clinicians of all various uh -huh. types, how does that translate to, you know, a clinician saying, okay, that sounds great, Sharon. How am I going to utilize this in the work I'm doing with, with, with my clients who are traumatized? Yeah. And, and I um, do consultations with therapists all around the world. I can do that with the Zoom. And I'm seeing therapists who need the support of each other to continue. They need to be seen and felt at a deep level 
for them to be able to offer that to their clients. And so I'm encouraging them to go into groups of, of at least four, where each can take a turn really talking from the depth of their feeling and their experience and really truly listening to each other. Not that they have to make a lot of responses to each other, but to be able to do that on a regular basis then gives them then that, that ability to listen to their, their clients in a new and fresh way. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we have to, in some ways, let go of everything we ever heard about trauma um, and come back to a place of really being heart to heart, soul to soul, and making that number one rather than the multitude of information and strategies that have accumulated. How do we come back to the essence, the truth of what it means to be human and suffering? that human beings have always known how to be there with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, we know this inside us. And are you suggesting that we kind of put aside uh, everything we know about trauma because that often tends to what get in the way of like connecting? Is that what you're saying? Well, what I'm suggesting is that we go underneath it. <clears throat> you know, it might be necessary and helpful in a way, but there's a place where we can we need to be here for each other not not uh that we need a mutuality in this time we we need to be true to what we're experiencing mm -hmm. and often i think what what i've seen over this it's been about 15 20 years i've been doing this trauma work is it's moved from this person to person, heart to heart, or soul to soul place into a need to, it's the life force guy, that we need to, we need to come back into this life energy inside us that we can feel and be able to bring that up so it's available for ourselves and for others. And, and, then, and then do our work. I'm not saying to not do our work. Right. But we've got it. And, you know, Antonio Damasio in his book, The Strange Order of Things, he's, he's got this science it down, is that as soon as we can pay attention to that life force, that energy of life within us, and begin to identify that as our feeling in the moment, and as we can be in presence of that and, and amplify that, that brings life to our own experience and to each other. And it's the life we need now to be able to work with the forces that are not life, that are, mm -hmm. are dividing us, are, are sickening us. And, and so coming to this, um, this place of life. And I, I, I have a background that I rarely talk about, but I, I have a degree, a master's degree in theology. And I, at one time, taught theology to high school students. And I, I kept going to what's the root of spirituality? What's the root of... And I realized that spirituality and psychology have the same roots. It's the human soul, the psyche. And, and we're in a time that we need to find life and bring life to each other. Mm. It, so in addition, or along with kind of setting aside everything we know about trauma in a sense, and of course not abandoning it, right? but what does this mean for uh, the, the, the practitioner, the therapist? What, do, what, is, this, what is this asking them to, to do? What is this requiring of them, in a sense? You know, what it's required of me, I can speak to that and what I see around me with other therapists, but it's required me to look at, at, at my own life, my own experience, and, and look at where I have failed to 
be open to others' experience in the moment. And that whatever the other is experiencing, is there a place where I can know how I experience it, that subjective place, but how I can be really open to seeing, hearing, and feeling the world from the other person's experience. And it's a kind of a profound empathy. The more I, I know about empathy and the more it opens up to be, so can I really see somebody that I have a really diametrically opposed political view? Can I sit with them and feel their anguish and their suffering? Um, so I think your question of what is it, it's asking the therapist to not only take care of their kids and to take care of their relationships and their parents or their, their responsibility to go deeper into what it means to, to, the, to bring out the deepest part of their own humanity and to live that out. And, and I, think, I think we can do it, mm -hmm. but I don't think we can do it alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's something about that to me that just it, it just it just excites me in the sense that um, it it just feels so human. It it feels yeah. so connected, and at the same time, I can tell you that when I was starting out when I got out of graduate school and when I was in graduate school and I was seeing clients, I was doing the exact opposite of that. I was clinging mm -hmm. to, you know, techniques and treatment modalities and trying to wedge them into meetings I was having with clients. And it was, it was any, anything but what you're talking about now. And there, it took me uh, a lot of uh, self-trust yeah. Not yeah, and, and trust in beingness in a sense, you know. Um, it's very exciting to me what you're talking about, Sharon, because I, it just feels like it honors who each of us is as a person, yes. and that's okay, right? And not only is it okay, guy, it is incredibly precious, mm. yeah. and it's needed in today's world. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. I mean, I, I, I think this is a beautiful message for people to hear, you know, who are um, wondering how to get through the days with their clients and how to get the, <laughs> through the days with their kids and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, I remember once when you were on here, you talked about, I think we were talking about authenticity and you, you had said that it, it, it's a day-to-day -day practice. This is something that is the day-to-day -day intentionality in a sense. Mm -hmm. You know, this is not something that... And my sense... Go ahead, I'm sorry. I was just going to say that this, you know, to... to I, I, I think this takes a, a, a willingness, certainly, an intentionality yeah. on our part. Right. It's like going in the cold water. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, um, it's not comfortable, and it's not safe, and it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit into all the little uh, hooks that we've learned how to learn to use. But it's about being real, mm. and and unless we're real, we're not going to awaken life. Like, what do you do, guy, to awaken life in that five-year-old? Or yeah. that seven-year-old when they get down about not having time with their friends and and watching my grandkids um, struggle again with online learning and just that aloneness that's coming. Mm -hmm. And as the fall gets on, how, what what are we going to do to bring about aliveness? And we we've had so many distractions and ways to do that, but we don't have them anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's in us. Mm -hmm. And it's in the relationship that that the life gets ignited and 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 then can burn through mm. um, the trauma of the moment to what's essential. Wow! I just want to remind everyone that I'm speaking with uh, Dr. Sharon Stanley, um, 
And Sharon, your website is uh, somatictransformation.com. That's right. Okay. That's People right can reach right. you there. And so are you, are you working? Are you oh, yeah. seeing clients? What are you doing right now? I spend two days a week with one-on-one -on -one clients. I, I know I need to keep doing that probably forever. Uh, well, as long as I can. But I'm also doing um, classes online, uh, but small groups. I, mm -hmm. I really believe in small groups. I, I'm, I'm also doing a group of um, lectures I'm putting online. And um, I have somebody helping me to get them onto Vimeo that I'm, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of putting on my website. So I'm getting a series of those to kind of go through some of the basic principles that I use in practice, this embodiment, the awareness, and the empathy, and then, and then how to do an inquiry, how to ask these questions, mm -hmm. and, and then how to use techniques. But right. most of all, how to reflect on our lived experience to find meaning. Yeah, I love that. Well, if and when those get up, shoot, yeah. them, shoot them to me and I'll put them on uh, the show notes page of the of the uh, episode here of the traumatherapistpodcast.com. Sharon, I love having you on here, man. I knew this was going to be amazing. <laughs> I wish well, you the I sure appreciate being asked, guys. Awesome. We'll keep in touch. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.